and to encourage you in your faith. And um, I wrote a few things down as I was sitting there, and I'm sorry I wasn't too talkative, but things happen when I before I speak. And um, the Lord's been talking to me about some things, and and personally about you tonight, what He's going to do here tonight, and. I know we're in the Easter season and we're preparing to see the stone rolled back. But I want to tell you, every day is Easter. I want to tell you that stone rolls back every day. Resurrection power is an everyday occurrence. And if it's not an everyday occurrence for you, get with it. Because you have the same power, the same anointing, the same holy walk, call on your life that every person sitting here has. And if you don't really quite get, grasp that, maybe tonight, maybe a part of our story will reach you because we are just so normal. We are so regular. And maybe we're going to see a few heads spin tonight. I know my story will make your head spin. Because I... I am no better, probably led a lot worse life than most of you sitting here. But the Lord decided to touch me, just like he has decided before we even said yes to this invitation, he has already ordained this night way in advance to touch you. So get ready and get prepared because he's going to move. He's going to move in a wondrous way, a miraculous way, a supernatural way. He's going to do things that you probably didn't think could happen to you. He's going to do it tonight. I guess it's turned up. <laughs> well, we're going to give you a little story, a little short, a short story on each of our backgrounds, where we came from, and then how Jesus touched our lives dramatically instantaneously, miraculously, back in 1990, and then what's happened to us since then. So we'll start with a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born in Rhode Island at a very young age. Come on, they don't get better than that. <laughs> <laughs> but before I was born, and this is something I hadn't shared before, but before I was born, my mother, who is, uh, she'll be 96 this year in November, by the way, a very healthy gal. I'll tell you a little bit more about her in her current, at her current age later. But before I was born, a few years before I was born, she had a, a um, another pregnancy, and the child was born, stillborn, and she was paralyzed. She was in the hospital. Doctors told her she would never ever walk again. They were certain of that. She had a experience where she felt herself above her body. And the Lord talked to her and said, no, it's time to go back. I'm going to heal you. Her faith healed her, and she left the hospital, not walking, but with a walker, crawling almost, dragging her feet. And she went through a few months, a number of months of rehabilitation on her own. And you'd never know she ever had a problem after that. So when they had me, they really thought I was their miracle baby because they didn't think they'd ever have another child. So I'm an only child. They didn't have any other than me. So I guess that makes me a brat. <laughs> but God heals today. And I grew up knowing that God heals today because she always told me that. But you know, she never told me of that experience ever. She still hasn't. She told Diane that experience, but she's never told me. <laughs> now, I did grow up in a, in a very godly home. The Bible was read every day. We said prayers before every meal. I said prayers before I went to bed at night. But I didn't know about being born again. I didn't know about the Holy Spirit. I knew who Jesus was. I mean, we celebrated Easter, we celebrated Christmas, I knew who Jesus was, I knew about the disciples, I, I, went to, I knew all the Bible stories, but I didn't know what this born-again thing was all about. I'd never heard about it. 
But I did know that God was with me every place that I went. Wherever I was, God was there. Because I thought it was kind of like he was always looking over my shoulder, you know? Yeah, right. uh, so I couldn't get away with anything. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor forsake you. And this is how I grew up in my childhood. But then I got a little older. I discovered girls. I was married at 19, had my first son, who's going to be 40 this year. When I was uh, 20, I worked at a bank, and I just drifted away from church. I just didn't go to church anymore. I had my own life. I was doing my own thing. And as a result, I found myself early 20s divorced. I had two young boys at that time. They went with their mother, not with me. So there I was alone. No church in my life. I still knew God was with me, but I didn't really talk to him very much. You know, I drifted some more. My hair got real long. I had a mustache down to here someplace. Wore clothes a little differently. I wasn't that clean-cut uh, college look that I was in the 50s and 60s when I was in high school. I had some, wore cowboy boots and jeans and thought I was pretty cool. Smoked a little dope, drank beer, swore a lot. I was really part of the in crowd. At least I thought I was part of the in crowd. Now I know I'm part of the out crowd. But you know, God was still with me. Back during that time period in the uh, 70s, really, at that time, I used to uh, do a lot of sports car rallying. Anybody here know what sports car rallying is? So we used to go cross country and... Uh, in our cars, a navigator and a driver, and we had a lot. Sometimes we'd go on 24-hour events, and I was on a 24-hour event, and we was in the it was in the winter time. It was up in either Vermont or New Hampshire. I can't remember which state we were. It was actually all of those, but I don't remember where the accident occurred. But we're coming down this mountain, and we slid on some ice. That is, the car did. Started going like this, and then all of a sudden we hit a dry patch, and it flipped on its roof, and it started going like this. And the car stopped right next to a guardrail. The only guardrail within a mile with about a 100-foot drop over the side of the mountain. As I look back on that, even though I wasn't in a relationship with him, he was still in a relationship with me. Because I know if it wasn't for him, that would have been it. You know, when in the early 70s I got a new job, in uh, North Alabama, Massachusetts, I was working for a manufacturing firm. Uh, I was in the computers. I was going to manage their computer department. And it wasn't too long after I got it there, I was pretty gung-ho, and I kind of learned the computer and everything, and I decided after a couple of weeks of working, I'd go in about 2 o'clock in the morning for some reason. I don't know why I decided that, but I decided to go in about 2 o'clock in the morning, and when I got there, I opened the door, and I smelled smoke. I looked in the manufacturing plant, and the place was on fire. I ran upstairs, called the fire department, called my boss, two in the morning, I really woke him up, and they caught the fire just in time and saved the building. I just thought of that story about, about a week ago. I'd forgotten all about it and God brought it back to my mind. It was he who asked me to go back into that plant at two in the morning. I know it now, I didn't even give it any thought then. So I was drifting. But he was still there, still in my life. You know, I don't think those things were coincidences. I think they were God instances. And Deuteronomy 4.29 says, And if you search for him with all your heart and soul, you will find him. You know, I found myself starting to speak to God, starting to ask for his help in my life. I met Diane. We moved back to Cranston, Rhode Island, where I grew up. We got married in 1984. We lived together for a couple of years first uh, with her two boys and with my daughter on weekends. My first two boys were already grown up at that time. We found a church near us. We began our life together in church. We brought our children to church. We raised them in church. We attended every Sunday. We taught Sunday school. 
We worked in the church. We were very hard at it. But we still didn't know anything about born again, Holy Spirit. But Diane was sick. She was very sick. When I met her, she told me she had Crohn's disease. I believed that God could heal her. I talked about it with her then because I grew up in a house that was in a healing house. And God healed us throughout my childhood as I grew up. But she had Crohn's disease. It was getting worse. It wasn't getting better. It was just getting worse and worse and worse. To help her with her housework, we hired a, a gal. Her name was Marie. We hired her to come in on a once a week basis to do the heavy housework and such so that Diane could just lay on the couch and rest. Well, God sent us a born again, spirit filled believer. We still didn't know what that was. <laughs> but that's who we sent. And it seems that, you know, Marie was over the head about God. She never Bible thumped us, if you will. She was just His light in our life. And one day, she asked Diane if she'd like to come to a special healing service that was happening in her church over in Massachusetts. That they were having some people in that would lay hands on the sick and see them recover. And Diane said, sure, why not? What have I got to lose? Diane will tell you a lot more of her story. But first, I'm going to let her get her two cents worth in. Good. <laughs> it's just appropriate to say it at this time, but you know, you can tell where um, Dick came from. You know, his family like was like Ozzy and Harriet, and Father Knows Best. Can you tell that? You know, it was like really nice, and they didn't swear or curse, and they never drank. And you understand all that? That was so cool to have to come from a family like that. Well, you know, my family was more like Archie Bunker and Meathead. <laughs> um, there was a lot of cursing, swearing going on, a lot of drinking going on, a lot of abuse happening. Very dysfunctional family. You know, when I, when I met Dick's mom and dad, I looked at them and I said, you know, I want to grow old with someone just like them. You know, and I, I just want to be in love like that forever. I, and I thought that was just so awesome. You know, just think of coming from a household where cursing wasn't even thought of. You walked in my, my home growing up and it was like there was a bunch of, bunch of drunken sailors in there. From daddy down to baby. It just happened that way. That's the way it was. I didn't think there was any other way. You know, coming from a protected household where, you know, you were kind of sheltered from all worldly things and, you know, the world can't touch you and, you know, Dick was very um, protected and shielded and sometimes I still tell him today, I have to remind him, I say, you know, honey, you, you, you just can't get it because you never experienced that, you know. Now, where I came from, the environment was pretty wide open. By the time I was 13, I was abused, um, sexually abused by my older married cousin. And um, I figured at that time, well, he made me a woman, so um, I started with the mask. And I felt that I was going to protect myself and I was going to get what I wanted out of life. And that's how it started. Because no one else could help me, protect me, show me where to go. And I went to Catholic schools all my life, grammar school and high school. And, you know, I even walked to, uh, to school and during Easter time, and I always think of it about this time of year, I went to um, all the Stations of the Cross and special Wednesday services, and I did all of that. And, um, and I went to church and all of that, and the rest of my family stayed home. And so I knew that when I made my first communion that... Jesus was going to live inside of me. Wow, I couldn't wait. That was, that was the day that, to me, something was going to happen because I wasn't going to be alone anymore and I would have a friend for life to talk to without someone telling me I was stupid or not going to be amounted up to nothing. And so, 
my first communion was very important. Um, I loved my little white dress and my veil, but I couldn't wait to take that host because I knew the sooner I did that, the, the better because I needed Jesus forever. And then I made my confirmation and I figured I was going to be a soldier for Christ because that's what they taught me in Sunday school and I was ready. I took on a new name in my confirmation name and I figured now I have my new name. And now I'm going to be a soldier. But nobody told me how. So I kind of left as you can know where the story's going, I kind of left things drifting a little bit, a little bit, because I didn't know how. I went to uh, uh, classes every week at school, and uh, the nuns couldn't stand me any longer. They used to have the priests come in and, and to the catechism lessons, because I asked them so many questions, I used to drive them nuts. This uh, catechism book says, and I says, yeah, but the good news says, I, I just wanted the truth. But that was about where my faith was. And then I went to college and I figured, well, if um, I'm going to do anything that's going to make me feel good. And if it feels good, I might do it again. No one can ever relate to that, right? No one ever did anything like that. I figured, well, if, if, I, if I drank enough and it felt good, I was going to do it. And if I smoked a little pot and that felt good, well, I'll do it some more. And Whatever it was, I figured I'll do it once. If I liked it, I'll do it again. And I figured I was in control, and that was the way life was going to be. I got married when I was 19. I had two boys, and by the time I was 29, um, we were on our way to divorce court. And uh, my, my two little boys, you know, they used to say, they used to even tell me, you know, Dick and I were living together for a couple of years and because I, fe I was afraid to get married, I didn't want to reproduce what I did the first time, so it was better just to live together. And every morning the boys would say, well, Mom, when are you going to marry Dad? And I, I used to tell them, I said, well, you know, Mommy just, I can't do it. I, it. Well, Mom, you know, we can really do this thing on our own. Where did they get that from? Me. But I realized that, see, when I met Dick, he just loved me unconditionally. I experienced that before. People wanted something of me in turn. Somebody was always looking for their peace. I didn't have it to give. And I finally met someone that just loved me and me. And I told him rotten stuff about me and he still loved me. I told him I would probably die with this Crohn's disease and he still loved me. Okay. Everything was okay. Even my language was okay. I even, you know, he grew up, you know, he started, you know, language was slipping and all that. Head was six times worse than him. Well, I got worse after living with her for years. <laughs> you know? That's the way it was. But I met his mom and dad and I said, I want to grow old just like them. And then his, now, I had Crohn's disease 12 years old. And I never had really a childhood. Uh, as when the kids were out sliding, he used to go to the country club and they used down the hills and all that. Well, I went out sliding, I, I couldn't go out because it was too cold and I was too, and I used to stay near the bed all the time. When we were, um, when younger growing up and did hockey and, and from, they didn't do football, but soccer, basketball. Well, when they hockey, I couldn't go in the ice because the cold affected me so bad that I just couldn't go in the rink. But I didn't want them to play. And I know mommy just can't go there because they're really sick. So they had to live with me being sick. It was so bad. By the, just before my healing, I had signed my last will and testament. And I went over with the boys and I asked them, well, if mommy dies, mommy's going to die pretty soon. And when she dies, I want to know I want to live. Because I want to make sure that, you know, you are going to be where you want to be. And they said, well, if... If we don't, Dad, um, happen, I says, well, you probably live with your father, and um, maybe you can visit with Dad. And they said, if we live with our father, we will never visit with Dad. We won't happen. So they had me run in my will that they wanted with their stepdad so that they would be able to see them. You know, it was Dick who really poured them the love, and he fathered them. He was a father to them. 
and appreciated that. They were ready, just like I was, to end it all. I used to, I couldn't wait for them to leave the house because once they, I could scream so bad and I used to hold it in and then I, and then I bargain with God, you know, just give me a minute without pain. Just one, just please Lord, just one minute. And that wasn't too good either. And then I said, well, you know, I'm no good here. I am no, I can't be a wife. My husband can't even crawl into bed next to me without me saying, please don't move, my body aches. Never mind, hug me or touch me. I couldn't get up and be a mom to my boys to make them breakfast and see them off to school. They used to get dressed and come, come in the bedroom and, and put on the llama. I'm ready to go to school now. And they used to, um, am I okay dressed? And I used to peel my eyes open and look at me. Yes, honey, you look great. They kissed me on the cheek and off they went to school. The bed or the couch, I used to tell them how to eat dinner and how to do the laundry so they can get their laundry done. See, things like this, this is a reality with Crohn's disease. It's a reality. Crohn's disease, deterioration of the intestine. It was known as at one time. And um, it doesn't get any better, it gets worse. And my father and I used to joke about it all because my father had heart problems. And we used to, he used to say, you don't know how sick I am. And I used to call him and father said, yeah, dad, uh, you don't know how sick I used to joke each other. We say, you know what? Coffins look better than us. That was the truth. That was the truth. People in coffins look better than us. All life, all through it all, I was seeing and hoping for something that was going to fill the void that I had. I knew I had Jesus, however, it didn't affect me the way I drank or talked or lived or... That didn't affect me. Matter of fact, some Christians even used to tap me on the shoulder and say, Well, how could have you have done that if you were a Christian? I figured I wasn't hurting anybody and, you know, God's God and He just loves me anyway. That is the truth. So the next time you bring one, someone to the Lord and they're living together, you don't have a right to tell them if they can't do that. The Lord will tell them in His time. It's about time we stop thumping the Bible on people's heads because the Holy Spirit straightens it all out. We don't have to do a thing. See, He starts from the inside and He works His way out. Unconditional love. A love that's fully, fully acceptance of just who you are. No, it's when I married Dick, it was like I was like Cinderella. You know, the night came and he put the sun on and they lived happily ever after. And be so long to say yes because I was afraid. It wasn't going to be like that. It was going to wear off. It was going to happen. But it was like that. It still is like that. You know, that is, that is really an awesome thing to have, to love someone. Someone that loves you like that. Maybe your spouse. That is a real great thing to have. It's Jesus with skin on, guys. That was my first reality check of who Jesus really was. So when God really stepped into my life and changed it, I realized that he works from the inside out. And he became Jesus inside first and then worked through the outside. So I became Jesus with skin on. You are Jesus with skin on. Remember that. That's important. See, Jesus swept me off my feet just the way Dick swept me off my feet. So it was May 1991 that we went to this church service over in uh, Massachusetts. And we sat there seeing and hearing things we hadn't seen or heard before. We heard people speaking in this weird language. 
We had no idea about. I saw them raising their hands in church and singing. We had no idea what this raising the hands was. And the people in to teach on healing invited a number of people up to the platform where they laid hands on them and we saw miraculous things happen right in front of our eyes. Carpet tunnel, backs, we saw a club foot totally straighten out instantaneously. We watched all this occur. And then by the time the day was over, they invited Diane up on the platform. And she told Diane a story about someone else who had Crohn's disease that she had laid hands on and they had been miraculously healed. She stretched forth her hands, laid hands on Diane, and instantaneously Diane went down in the spirit slain in the spirit. We had no idea what that was either. And she got off that platform totally miraculously healed that day. And she's been 100% healed ever since. But since that he... Now that was, that was the time when Jesus became real to each of us. Diane told you about her encounter with Jesus when she had her first communion and how she wanted him inside of her and I didn't know about any of that she knew more about that than I did but neither one of us were really walking with Jesus the way he wanted us to walk with him and that day when he made himself so real to us when she got off that platform totally changed we started changing on the inside we went back and saw the pastor of that church within the next within a couple of days of the healing and uh, that's when he led us through the prayer and we became born again. Went back to his church service a couple of nights and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And things just started happening. Now, well that led us to holding a number of uh, studies and small groups and so forth in our home. We've done that ever since uh, 1991, ever since Diane's healing. It led us to start the Evans Ministries in 1999. And uh, we're now pastoring a church called the Celebration House in Cranston. This is Jesus tells us in Mark 16, 15 to go. And we took that literally, that he's inside of us and we are to go. It says, and then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news. Preach it everyone, everywhere. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe, every one of us who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. Every one of us here is to cast out demons in Jesus' name. They will speak new languages. And depending upon which translation, they will speak in tongues. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they don't, if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. And this last sentence, they will be able to place their hands on the sick and heal them. Every one of us in this room, every spirit-filled believer in this room, can lay hands on the sick and heal them. You know, Jesus te heals today he wants to heal each and of you. You know, Diane and I have eaten our hands on the sick, and we've seen them often and often and often. It wasn't too long after Diane's experience and uh, her healing from Crohn's disease that the same gal, the, house, the, the housekeeper that came in to, that invited us to the church service, called us and said, I've got another client that, it's an, it's an older person, he's in his 70s, and he has Crohn's disease. Would you go over and pray with him. So we went over and we laid hands on him and on his wife. We gave them a we gave them a healing cloth, a little piece of cloth that we had laid hands on and prayed with, with them and told them to wear it on him and we gave them some healing scriptures to read and we left. We prayed for him. About six months later he gave us a phone, well she gave us a phone call all excited she said, we just came back from the doctors. You're the first one we had to tell. He doesn't have Crohn's disease anymore. And she said, what we didn't tell you is that I had stomach cancer. But we didn't pray for that. She said, I had st stomach cancer. And we cut that prayer cloth and I wore half of it. And he wore the other half. And my, pan my cancer's gone. 
God heals today. He heals today. So we've seen cancer, bad backs, arthritis. Matter of fact, I've got to tell you a quick story. I talked about my mother. She's going to be 96 this year. It was about, I think it was a couple of years ago now, two or three years ago. Uh, she was actually playing golf until she was uh, 89. She stopped playing golf at 89 because her fingers were bothering, starting to get a little gnarled up with arthritis. Anybody here know what arthritis is about? Yeah. And then it wasn't too long after that that she was complaining that she couldn't, she couldn't button her buttons and she couldn't knit anymore. And she likes to knit little, little hats for the babies in the hospital and blankets for the babies in the hospital. They all get together at the place, the retirement center that she's at, and things. And she couldn't work because she couldn't handle the knitting needle. I was visiting one day, and, and I was just felt led to kneel down, grab a hold of her hands. And I grabbed her hands, and I commanded the spirit of arthritis to leave her body and for her hands to straighten out. And then I didn't give it any more thought. I said goodbye, and I left. And I realized about six months later, she's kneeling again. The hands are almost, all the, all the gnarling is gone from the hands. Everything is working perfectly. So I said, my, isn't it great that God heals your arthritis? She said, I never had arthritis. <laughs> 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 you know, it, it, it doesn't always require that we touch somebody. See, it's his touch, not our touch. Amen. It's the anointing. The anointing can touch from afar just as it can from near. Oh, we can lay hands on the sick and they are they do recover. And they recover by just being under the anointing. Many have been touched during our talks, healed as they listen. Now Jesus heals today. And he wants to heal each and every one of you. During dinner this evening, I hate this Christian stuff. The Lord was speaking to me, so I had to write down that. But I was really inspired about what was going to happen here tonight. So a few of the things that I knew that I was going to do, I started writing them down. One thing is that someone here has arthritis and the Lord's going to touch them tonight. Someone has a heart, and the Lord's going to, to open up the valves tonight. You know, we were eating at a restaurant um, last week, and the hostess was bringing us to the table, and she was limping, and she hurt her knee. So I said to her, I said, mind if I um, pray for you? And she says, no, please do. And I says, well, is it okay if I touch your knee? And she said, okay. No, not like the candle on the way home. And so I did. I reached over and I touched her knee and I asked the Lord to heal the ligaments in her knee and in Jesus' name. And, and then I says, and before we leave, I want to do it again. And before we left, she was cleaning off a table for one of the waitresses. So I scooted in the booth and I, I put my hand on her knee. I says, I'm back. Um, you're going to get a second dose. And, and, I, and I didn't say much at all. And I just let my hand there, right on her knee. And I said, do you feel that? And she said, hmm, oh yeah, it's getting hot. Oh, it's tingly hot. I said, now that's, that's the Holy Ghost, that's Jesus. He's just straightening out your name. And we left. I believe that that is how the Lord wants us all to live, being sensitive to what he wants us each to do. Someone with Crohn's disease here, and I, I'm not just saying that be because I was inspired. Someone told me that someone with Crohn's disease was going to be here tonight. I know the Lord is going to heal tonight. Because I know when he healed me, I realized that he gave me a gift. A precious gift. But it does not come without love for us. Because the Lord filled me with so much of his love and I just like, I was like a sea sponge. I was just sopping it all up for myself because I every drop. But I was so sopped up with it, it just oozes right over. 
And when that happens, the gifts are exposed. God can be manifest in a great way. So I continue to be like a sea sponge. Shouldn't we all? I believe that the Lord had prepared me for today, for my walk with him today. Because where I came from is where he has me minister. Where you came from, that is your ministry ground. So your history, you've heard this before, I know your history is really his story revealed in your life. And those are the people you are to touch. Just it swept me off my feet when I met him. And I can't say it was at the second I met you. It was a little ongoing. But when he really swept me off my feet, I knew, I knew that I knew that, man, I was going to love this man forever. I didn't care what his bad points were. I didn't look at them at all, and I decided I didn't even want to change him. I would take him just the way he was. Because he loved me so, and he, he's a great provider, and he's an awesome man. And, and I didn't even say an awesome man of God, did I? He was just an awesome man. He was a real good guy. He was really aunt. He was trustworthy. See, and then that day when I was called up to the platform, just like the pools of Bethesda, you know, John 5 talks of pools. That the angel comes down and the waters begin to stir and, and people are led to the pools to be healed. Well, that's kind of what happened to me that day. I was kind of like sucked up on that platform and I was sucked right in the pool. And that pool of healing deliverance happened right within me. When I laid on that platform, my body was like a fish out of water. My legs were flopping, my arms were wailing, my stomach was heaving, my chest was heaving. I was going through something. It was holy hell, let me tell you. That's just what it was. Because I was scared half out of my wit. And all I kept, I was screaming subconsciously. No one heard me. Jesus saved me. Jesus saved me. I felt like Noah. Excuse me. Jonah. You know, when Jonah was swel swallowed by the whale and he felt he was going to perish and die and the waters were overtaking him and overcoming him, that's just what it felt like to me. I felt like I was in a tidal wave and I was going down for the count. But then when my eyes opened and I got off the platform, I realized something. Something happened in me. Something tremendous happened. I looked at Frances Hunter, because it was her and Charles that laid hands on me, and said, well, do something you couldn't do, honey. And I just started beating my belly and bending over and stretching. And she said, well, do something you couldn't do. I said, I couldn't do any of that. Wow. You know, when I, Charles and Francis, it's my spiritual mom and dad. And when we met them a few years ago now, I put a, a bear hold hug on her and I wouldn't let her go. And we wrote each other emailed each other after our meeting and, and, I, and I told her how much I just loved her. And that day, everything she taught, I hung on like it was gospel truth because it was gospel truth. What I'm telling you tonight is gospel truth. And the waters are stirring tonight. And the Lord's going to heal tonight. He's going to prepare a path for you. He has a mission for you. I'll tell you, don't turn your TVs on and watch the war because we have one right here, right now, today. You have one to fight tonight, today, tomorrow. We don't need TV. We don't need to be tangled up in things that we have no control over. The only thing we have control over is our prayers is heaven.
The only thing we have control over is when we get out of bed and what we say and who we touch and who we talk to next. That is the plan that God has. But he can't do it through you unless you have been prepared, unless you've had a touch, unless you're ready to do what he has for you to do. If you have arthritis tonight, you should be up here right now. Because there are other people that you need to touch to be healed from arthritis. If you have a problem, you should be up here right now. Because the Lord wants to heal your heart and your valves. He wants to lower your blood pressure right now. Diabetes. Kidneys. Come on, don't wait. The pools are stirring. You know, I know you're here. Because I heard very clearly, I know that I know. See, it's up to you. You can say, well, well, the next time, the next place, the next this, the next that. You know what? This might be your only chance. This might be it tonight. And if you're serious, and if you want what God has for you to do, you better get up here right now. See, I get it seriously. When Charles and Francis told me, you know, you gotta go and you gotta tell, you gotta tell and you gotta tell, I tell my story everywhere I go, every chance I get, I tell them what the Lord has done for me. I tell them about the miracles that I see day in and day out. You know, you know they say, oh, it's only for the young ones. They're the ones that have the future with the Lord. Poo, 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 poo. He's got you right now, right where you are, and he wants to use you in your arena because there are people around you that no one else can reach. There is no age barrier here in the Lord. People here that are suffering from anxiety, grief, depression. You might even be taking medication for it. The Lord wants to touch you. He wants you to lower your prescription levels. Now I'm not saying get off your prescriptions, guys. I'm saying the Lord's going to do it. You're going to go back to the doctor and the doctor's going to say, oh, it should be a lower level. You hear me? When Jesus touches you from the inside out, he touches you with such a power and grace. He brings you to such a place of transformation and growth that you, you probably won't, un you won't, you won't believe it. God is so good, you just won't believe it. You won't believe it. You won't believe it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this evening, Lord God. We ask that your grace is upon us. As we leave to travel home, Lord, make us different than the way we came in. Lord, we are not wearing our funeral clothes tonight. We will no longer wear them any longer. We will put on the garments of praise. We will put on our white robes. We will dance in the streets and sing your praises, O Lord God. We will be grateful for who you are. We give you thanksgiving. Lord, please, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us for not being who we should be. Lord, for, for grieving the Holy Ghost. Lord, forgive us. Lord, we ask that you would touch us in such a way that we can't go back anymore. We cannot go back anymore. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Fill our sister, Lord. Filled with your healing presence, Lord God. Healing presence.